afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this LIDC webinar. My name is Shereen John and I work in the communications team with LIDC. So I'm just going to go over some housekeeping notes um, before I hand you over to our chair for this event, Professor Laura Hammond. So you will probably be aware that this event is one of a number that LIDC runs. If you check out our socials and our website, which we hope you do, you will see that we have another event planned for later in this month, 27th of May, in support of Menstrual Hygiene Month. We also do podcasts, interviews, blogs, newsletters. We run an internship program and we hold networking and training events for our members. So if you're not a member of LIDC already, then please consider joining us. You can find information about that on our website. And also do please connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. We also have a YouTube channel. This event is being recorded and will be posted on our website and via our socials. So to minimize distractions, we're gonna ask that you keep your cameras and microphones off while presentations are in progress. I can see you've already done that. So thank you very much for that. We also encourage live tweeting. The event hashtag is LIDC seminars, all one word with LIDC in capitals and we tweet at LIDC underscore UK. You should all have had an email with the Twitter handles for our speakers and their organizations. And we have factored in time for discussion and questions once the panel have finished speaking. Please indicate that you'd like to ask a question by raising your virtual hand, which is in the reaction section on your Zoom screen. And if you're called on to ask a question, please do go ahead and use your video and obviously your microphone to ask to do that. If you prefer to have your question read out, then please type your question in the chat and indicate clearly that you'd like it read out on your behalf. We will do our very best to get to all the questions in the order that we see them and we'll aim to finish at 2.15 p.m. We are obviously very delighted and honored to have such a great panel of strong, active researchers, campaigners, academics, women. And we're particularly grateful to Professor Laura Hammond for so kindly agreeing to chair the event today. So just a few words about Professor Hammond. She has been conducting research on conflict, food security, migration and diasporas in and from the Horn of Africa since the early 90s. She's currently team leader of the EU Trust Fund's Research and Evidence Facility on Migration and Conflict in the Horn of Africa. And she heads up the London International Development Centre Migration Leadership Team. Laura's also done consultancy for a wide range of organisations working in the development and humanitarian spheres, including the UNDP, USAID, Oxfam, Médecins Sans Frontières, and the International Committee of the Red Cross and the World Food Programme. So, with no further ado, welcome to this event, and with very great pleasure, I hand you over to Professor Laura Hammond. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen. Um, it's really nice to be here and um, gives me a good opportunity to make sure that I can attend a, this really important event. Um, as you'll have seen, no doubt, from the, the kind of blurb that described what we we're going to be talking about today, there's a lot of attention that's been placed on the relationship between climate change, environmental change and migration and displacement. Um, surely there is a very strong, there are many different kinds of strong connections. But there's also, I think, quite a lot of misperception about the relationship between um, movement of one kind or another and uh, climate change. And I hope that today some of we can get into some of those misperceptions and look at what the evidence actually tells us about how and why uh, and under what conditions people tend to move in response to environmental change. We have a really great uh, panel today, and um, we're going to. I'm going to introduce them all at the beginning because uh, some of their presentations are going to um, seamlessly flow from one to the next. So let me introduce all of them at first, and then then I'll hand over the floor to the, our first speaker. Um, Fiona Broom is our first uh, speaker. She'll, she's the deputy editor for features and podcasts at Sidev.net. 
Um, she's a freelance journalist working across South Asia and the Middle East. She's reported on and researched climate migration and environmental conflicts. And she holds an MSc in environmental management from SOAS. Um, a second will be Amy North, who is an associate professor in education and international development at the UCL Center for Education and International Development. Her research is concerned with understanding inequalities in relation to education, particularly in low income contexts. She has particular interests in literacy, adult education, women's empowerment, and migration. Then our third speaker will be um, Elaine Chase who is together with me, a member of the LIDC led migration leadership team. Um, maybe we should say the, the migration leadership team or the MLT was formed about three years ago. And we um, have been over that time building up a network of migration researchers around the world um, and trying to kind of take the pulse of um, key issues and themes in migration studies that um, that deserve more attention, but also at the ways in which migration research is carried out and sort of looking at methodologies and and opportunities for what we might call decolonizing the research um, structures that go on within migration studies. Sorry, Elaine, that's a bit of a digression from your introduction, but um, Elaine is an associate professor in education, health promotion and international development at UCL in the Institute of Education. Her work explores the sociological dimensions of health, well being, and the rights of individuals and communities, particularly those most likely to experience marginalization and exclusion. And then finally, last but not least, we will hear from Charlotte Nussi, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at CEID. She works on the Transforming Universities for a Climate Change Study, for a Changing Climate Study. Uh, which explores the impact of locally generated climate actions in Brazil, Fiji, Kenya, and Mozambique. Her research focuses on the relationship between education and intersecting inequalities, particularly around gender and lifelong learning. So I'm going to pass over to Fiona to start. Should I just uh, reiterate one thing that, that Shireen says, which is um, if you have questions, please just put them in the chat. You can do that at any point. I'd rather have people write them out now and, or as we go along so that, rather than uh, forget them by the time we get to the Q&A session. So please feel free to use the chat box as we're um, going along here. So uh, Fiona, would you like to take us off? Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everybody. So my name is Fiona Broom, and I'm the deputy editor for features and podcasts at SciDevNet. Um, SciDevNet is part of the uh, an LIDC member. Um, and if you're not familiar with us, we are the world's leading source of news and analysis um, on science for development. So we report uh, focus only on the global south. Um, so given the expertise that we have amongst our speakers today, I thought that um, I would just begin with offering a little perspective on how reporting on um, climate migration and or environmental displacement, depending on the language that you use, um, how that sort of developed over the past decade um, and how research researchers and media can sort of come together to continue moving this story forwards. Um, so I would say that um, climate and migration it was an issue that I became aware of sort of around 2015. I think I was fairly late to the party. Um, but in, in thinking about preparing for this event, um, I realized that uh, in a way my life um, was kind of built on climate migration. Um, the land that I grew up in when I was a kid in Australia, in um, Southeastern Australia, the, the land that we lived on was cleared by bushfires a few years before we moved onto the land. It, it had been um, a fruit growing region. And so the growers, instead of going back and replanting their orchards, they left, the land was put up for sale and, and we moved in. Um, but I'd never really sort of thought of that as being uh, an example of, of climate migration. Um, so bushfires have always been a big part of my life. Southeastern Australia uh, is the most bushfire prone um, part of the world or forest fire or wildfire. Um, and so in 2009, uh, in the state of Victoria, um, in, in the summer of 2009, there was the worst bushfire that had ever been experienced. It was 
later called Black Saturday. And so two days after Black Saturday, I began my first job as a reporter. Um, and the fires, I think they continued to burn for about six weeks or two months, something like that. And so essentially my, my first years as a reporter were really consumed by recovery from the bushfires and um, sort of looking ahead. But interestingly, at that time, I really don't remember much of the conversation being about climate change or how the fires had in any way, um, there just really wasn't conversation about links between that fire and, and climate. Um, despite the fact that, that the day that the fires broke out, it was 47 degrees in the city, there were 100 kilometer hour winds. Um, and but in the recovery from that event, um, the councils had to start thinking about whether they were going to let people return to the regions where the fires had happened in the same way that now we're seeing um, uh, limits on construction in some coastal areas due to erosion and, and those sorts of effects. Um, and so, yeah, I'd never, at that time, I hadn't really thought about that Australia itself was producing climate migrants because um, uh, in my reporting as a freelancer from about 2015 on, I'd really focused on the global south, but um, on reflection, yeah, that's exactly what, what is happening in Australia. Um, so a few years after that, in around 2015, 2016, I was working in India at um, a little NGO called the Water Conflicts Forum, which is in Maharashtra, which is uh, currently one of the epicenters of India's COVID crisis. Um, and at the time, the state was experiencing quite a long-term drought, I think, um, the causes of which were varied. Um, I think it was in part a meteorological drought. Uh, and I started to realize that there were communities around the city where I was, which is Pune, um, that there were communities of farmers who were uh, temporarily in the cities um, and then they would move back out to the villages um, uh, once the monsoons broke. Um, by the time I figured out that this was uh, something that happened, the monsoon had broken, uh, everybody had returned to their villages and so the following year I followed up on the story. I was in Pune again um, and I, I went and spoke um, with with some of the villagers and I'll just drop for you some links into the chat box which you can uh, follow if you like. So um, so I wrote a, a, a feature story for the new internationalist magazine um, which was called Lessons from India's Thirst Economy um, and I reported how um, displacement camps had been set up in Mumbai in 2016 to accommodate the hundreds of families who were fleeing drought um, in from the agricultural reason, regions and how um, in recent surveys, 70% um, of farmers had said that they'd suffered crop failure, which was partially due to changes in rainfall patterns um, and lack of access to irrigation. And many were saying that they didn't see uh, any point in returning home. And, um, so the people I was talking to in the city were saying exactly the same thing that if, um, you know, if, if access to water didn't improve then there was no need for them to, to go back, that they would just stay in the cities. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of um, uh, internal movement um, around that time and across probably the previous two decades. Um, for that story, I also traveled out to, um, it's probably one of the hottest places I've ever been, considering I grew up in a bushfire prone area. Um, so I went out to meet with a women's organization, which is called the Mandeshi Foundation. Um, and they had been supplying, uh, they're called fodder camps. Um, so in the dry seasons, a lot of organizations and some political parties would set up camps where you could take your livestock and there would be feed for them. And essentially people would just sleep next to their livestock um, during the dry, se dry season and then move back during the wet season. Um, but there'd, there'd been um, an 18 month period, I think, where people had been at the fodder camps. And so the Women's Foundation uh, just thought there's got to be a better way of, of managing this situation. And they started to, to build 
um, some reservoirs, just small scale reservoirs, um, sort of through this network of villages. Uh, and as a result, the, the productivity of the crops increased because they had greater access to water, um, their sanitation improved, and everybody was able to stay in their homes. Um, and uh, so, I mean, you sort of, you would call that sort of solutions journalism is the name that that's normally given, um, in which rather than just presenting the issue and saying, here's the problem, you um, highlight solutions, which is not generally the way that I go about things because I think that the media has a, a deeper um, and more complex um, role to play rather than simply offering solutions. But in that context, um, I really wanted to be able to just offer something um, that showed that there were options. Um, so I've got a few examples then. I joined SciDevNet just last year, just about five weeks prior to the pandemic, but I had a little dig through um, SciDev's reporting over the years and I'll just drop some links in that the chat, everybody can take a look as they wish. Um, so from, I found that from July 2013 to November 2014, SciDev published um, a rolling series which was called Focus on Migration, which was written by Max Martin, who um, was a do doctoral candidate researching um, climate related migration at the University of Sussex. Um, and so that first link that I've just dropped in the headline is um, focus on migration, don't scapegoat climate change. Um, and then we had uh, this article uh, from October 2014, which was titled Focus on Migration, a closer look at climate refugees. And I thought it was interesting that the, um, the ref it, was, it was sort of uh, like an implied um, phrase at the time. So I think that probably indicates that it wasn't uh, a commonly used or commonly understood expression. Um, we then move on to 2017, and we've got a story here, climate related migration pressing but poorly regulated. Um, so I think we can sort of see some of the progress in perhaps understanding and um, also reporting. But then we've got this story in 2018, climate change forcing internal migration, says the World Bank, um, which sort of surprised me because I would have thought that by 2018, it was perhaps that was something that may have been understood, though it may have been the case that um, the World Bank making that statement may have been um, surprising. Um, and then we've got here in 2019, Climate now biggest driver of migration study finds, and 2020 climate change and conflict could fuel hunger in 2020. Um, and so I'll just wrap up. But I was at an event at the Pulitzer Center a week or two back, which was called "By the Numbers: Using Data in Environmental Investigations." Um, and Abram Liscarton was uh, talking about a recent series he published. Um, between the New York Times Magazine and ProPublica, which traced the potential impact of an overheating planet on human migrations. Um, and the description says the findings relying on a sophisticated model for predicting people's decisions to flee uninhabitable parts of the globe make clear that without urgent action, a vast remapping of the planet's population could lead to catastrophe. Um, so that's just kind of a, a, a brief summary of some of the changes in reporting and um, I suppose also research and how understanding has developed and how that's fed through and been communicated via um, some parts of the media. So uh, if anybody has questions towards the end about um, ways of communicating research, I'm super happy to help out. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Fiona. That's really interesting. Um, we're going to now move into um, hearing from Amy, and I think Amy, Elaine, and Charlotte are going to kind of do a, a sort of joint uh, presentation in some ways. So, Amy, do you want to start? Sure. Shireen, would it be possible to share the slides? Yes. 
Thank you. Um, so as Laura said, the three of us are going to um, have a, a joint presentation moving from one of us, from me onto Elaine and then onto Charlie. Um, we'll all be talking about um, from our perspectives from the Centre for Education and International Development, but um, as Laura explained, Elaine's also bringing in viewpoints from her role in the migration leadership team and Charlie be talking more specifically about the research project she's involved in on transforming universities for a changing climate. But common to, to all of us is a particular concern with education and understanding the connections between education and then ideas around immobility and migration in the context of climate change. Would you mind going on to the next slide, please, Shireen? So I'm going to start just by giving an overview of our starting point in relation to exploring the education, migration, climate change nexus. And um, then I'll pass on to Elaine, who will say a bit more about some of the kind of wider debates and discussions around the politics of climate change, migration, impl and implications for research that have helped frame the way that we've been looking at some of these issues. And then finally, um, Charlie will talk a bit more about local knowledges and perspectives on climate change, particularly in relation to small island states, um, drawing on her, her work with the um, Transforming Universities Research Project. Um, so in the Centre for Education and International Development, um, we have a specific research strand that's coordinated by Elaine and I, that's concerned with understanding the relationship between education, migration and immobility and the implications of that of migration for thinking about the relationship between education and development. Um, we also have, a, there's also a sister strand on education and climate change that um, Charlie is involved with. But until now, we haven't really been um, looking at the interconnections between these two areas of work. So we really valued the opportunity that this seminar provided to, to start that conversation and to start looking at the, the interconnections between those two strands of work, which are both key strand areas of work for, for the Centre for Education and International Development. Um, as part of our work in the um, coordinating the, the strands of work on education, migration and immobility, um, Elaine and I ha are currently in the process of developing an edited volume um, education, migration and development um, with Bloomsbury. Um, just a little flag that will be forthcoming next year. And um, we, we became interested through working on this volume and thinking about the, the chapters that would be included in it, in thinking about the relationship between climate change, migration and education. And what we found as we started to, to dig around and think about um, chapters that might be exploring that relationship is that there's actually been very little research that's explicitly concerned with education in relation to climate change and migration. But that nonetheless, as we brought the chapters together and started to look at the, the themes running through the book as a whole, we found that issues of climate change and ideas around climate related mobilities were running through many of the chapters in the book, even if they didn't have climate as their specific entry point. So I'm just going to speak now to some of those themes that we see emerging as we look across, uh, across the book as a whole. Thank you, Shireen. Um, so what the, the chapters in the book, I think, really speak to is the, the complex nature of climate migration, education, development interactions, and seeing climate change and climate re related mobility, not as a new crisis, but as interacting with other social, cultural, economic and political factors driving migration, but often over many years and many decades in quite complex ways. And um, what we're interested in is both the concern with how those interacting factors, including issues of climate change, environmental instability, and climate related mobilities impact on education, but also then the potential impact of education on um, engaging with uh, and mitigating some of those, fa those factors. Um, and we see that emerging in different ways in the book. So um, for example, issues of climatic and environmental instability as affecting livelihoods and therefore associated educational aspirations, um, 
linked to rejection of traditional vocational learning, for example, that that might be linked to livelihoods now seen as unsustainable, unsustainable in favour of forms of education associated with local and international abilities. So, for example, prioritising English language learning education that might be linked to aspirations to, to migrate both locally and also internationally. And we see that in chapters um, reporting on different facets of this relationship in Senegal and India, for example. Um, but then also another theme emerging is the importance of, of learning from communities with many, many years of experience of managing um, fragile environments, for example, mobile pastoralist communities, and thinking how we can incorporate that knowledge and learning in education for sustainable development, thinking in particularly about around the framing of, of education within the sustainable development goals framework. Um, so that's just a very kind of brief introduction to some of our emerging thinking. And I'm now going to hand over to Elaine, who's going to talk a little bit more about some of the kind of wider debates that, that we see this work as connecting into. helps if I unmute. Um, thanks very much, Amy. Um, and it was really interesting, uh, Fiona, I really enjoyed your introduction and, and, and raising how some of these ideas have been reported on in very, in quite distinct ways, really, across the media and different, different types of media. But I just wanted to highlight some of, um, of how the framing and politics of climate change migration or environmental migration is, is, is very much a disputed field. And there are a range of sort of myths and misconceptions and misunderstandings and still a, lo a long way to go in terms of our understanding. We hear a lot about the problematic use of waves and rising, tide, rising tides of climatic related migration, often ideas around movement from the global south to the global north, um, which, have, which are very poorly um, founded in, in terms of research and evidence. There's also the idea that climate related movement is something new as you know as Amy has just indicated um, it's something that communities have been responding to and dealing with over over many centuries really. And then there's a growing body of work now, um, as indicated by Fiona about increasing research disputes um, that the climate change is a single factor in migration. Um, it's much more about intersecting um, factors which are social, economical, uh, uh, economic, political and cultural. Um, and there are important distinctions between those, who, those people who move and those who don't move, those who can and those who can't move. Uh, and these are really, really important. So immobilities in the, in the context of climate change are as important as, as, as movement. So really what we're dealing with is climate change um, connecting to much bigger questions of global inequalities, global neoliberalism and colonial legacies, um, which we really need to engage much more fully with. There's also the very disputed notion of the climate refugee and big debates that, that, that are around that, which again ignore these intersecting inequalities and reasons why movement people move. Um, there's also the idea that people are moving and migrating always very long distances, uh, as I mentioned earlier, often um, across continents, whereas most migration is, is internal uh, within countries, within regions, um, and not over huge distances. There's also this sense of uh, long term unidirectional movement of people, um, but really we need to engage with the temporalities and the multi-directions of movement. So some is short term in relation to seasonal changes, et cetera. And it's often cyclical over periods of time um, and, um, and multi-dimensional um, and not unidirectional. Importantly, I think um, from a political perspective, responses to climate change migration are often driven by the securitization agenda. Um, uh, the UN Security Council talks about mass climate migration and the a risk of exacerbating conflicts, etc. Um, and so there are big, um, there are big sort of political agendas behind this, which need uh, checking and and looking at critically. Um, Laura introduced the migration leadership team, um, which has been around now for about three years, 
um, and we were funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council in order to develop a strategic, a strategic agenda for funding migration research. Um, the work really went about identifying thematic priorities for research funding globally. Um, it uh, looked at finding ways of funding research which would promote equitable partnership working in research. And it also looked um, at ways of promoting the greatest impact um, from migration research. So we engaged with some questions of um, climate change emerged um, uh, as, as, as an issue within the, in the, within the great number of many other themes um, um, from our analysis. But we did find there was limited UK funded research on climate change and migration uh, specifically. Um, there was also an identified need to shift from policy driven technocratic research to more interdisciplinary work, which was blending the social sciences and the arts and humanities. Um, there was also an identified need to look at what research was already going on, particularly in the global south and in, in, in regions such as Latin America, Africa and South Asia. Um, which really engages better with the complexities of mobilities related to climate, um, which is grounded in local knowledges and lived experiences, and which is currently under resourced. So rather than um, helicoptering in and developing new research agendas, really look at what's already there and supporting that better. Um, and that there needed to be a greater focus on experiences of adaptation resilience or resistance, if you like, sustainability and well-being within, within communities which are used to dealing with climatic changes. Um, and other work by uh, Ingrid Boas and others have highlighted, I think, some really, really important principles to think about when, we, uh, when we're uh, looking at research on, um, on climate-related migration. Um, first of all, the need to interrogate the assumption that climate change alone leads to mass migration. As I mentioned earlier, it's usually a, a mixture of very complex and interconnecting factors that people move for. Um, if we move from the idea of climate uh, migration to climate immobilities and immobilities, then that sort of idea gets much better at the, at the nub of complexity of movements and the temporalities why some people move and others stay, what, what are the choice factors, the circumstance factors, et cetera. Um, the impact of mobilities on places of origin, but is also on places of transit and destination. And it moves us away from the idea of mobility as being unidirectional, particularly good or bad or monocausal. Um, they talk about understanding climate mobility as the new normal and exploring how climate change alters the interconnections and patterns of human mobility in different contexts and uh, globally, but also in response to different mitigation, mitigating policies. Um, the need for research methods which capture the nonlinear complexities of mobility and immobility. This focus on destination and transit context and not just on sending context and how response policies are framed and implemented. And really importantly, that um, such research works from local and indigenous knowledge bases and priorities, that there's really so much to learn from, um, from communities. And on that note, I'm going to pass over to Charlie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Shireen, we seem to have lost the slides. <clears throat> So I'll just talk while we bring those back up. I have to interrupt you, I forgot I was unmuted. I, um, I had stopped sharing because the next slide was to the video. So I didn't know if you wanted the video on and I needed to stop sharing for that. So just let me know when you want the video to play. Okay, or sure, yeah. Um, it would be great to have the, the logo of the project and the pictures up. Okay, sure, um, I'll put them up, thank you. So I'm, I'm Charlie and as, as people have mentioned, I come from um, a much larger research project um, in Brazil, Fiji, Kenya and Mozambique. And the focus of our research um, is really around connections between higher education responding to climate change um, and um, uh, the ways in which um, that uh, can be 
um, working through locally generated activities, locally generated initiatives and locally generated climate actions. And so what I want to do in this presentation is to really draw on some very rich discussions with colleagues in Fiji who were unfortunately unable to join um, the, the um, webinar today because of the kind of prohibitive time uh, zone issue. Um, but just to really acknowledge Rosiana Lagi and Felipe Vesa, who are from our international partner, the University of the South Pacific, which is a hub university of 12 different um, nations within uh, the Pacific. And so what I really wanted to reflect on is my own position at the beginning of this presentation in relation to climate change and to the work that we do. Um, as you can hear, I'm from a British um, community and um, working at a British university. And so one of the things that was really important for us at the start of the project was to reflect on the ways in which um, climate is kind of bound in complex questions of justice and injustice, and to really start to understand what climate is, what climate change is. And it's really instructive, I think, to reflect on the fact that the word, the expression climate change was itself something that came through political processes to move away from global warming at the kind of behest of the lobbying around fossil fuels, to move us away from thinking around climate change, from global warming, which sounded very alarming, to climate change, which sounded much more neutral. So part of the work that we do within this project is to really reflect on what climate change is and does, and to think not just in terms of mitigation of reducing or lowering emissions, but also in terms of adaptation, in terms of resilience and in terms of resistance. So a much broader understanding of climate change. But the second reflection I wanted to make is that our research project began at a pretty much um, the beginning of the global pandemic. And so it's quite ironic that in the context of talking about mobility, we're also talking about a context in which many people are staying at home. And Fiji's just entered its first um, national lockdown, having escaped um, COVID before they now have community transmission. And so there was a sense in which it was really important for us to share um, very uh, fine grained locally generated stories around climate change. And I've signaled some of these um, through the books that you can see the front text of. So the end we start from, which is set in uh, London, Garden Island, which is set in, in India, moving across to Venice and to America and different aspects of climate change throughout the narrative and Portiki, which is set in um, uh, New Zealand. And these three narratives of climate change really weave together lots of different dimensions of migration, of movement to and from different places, and also of staying in place, of resisting colonial and settler extractivism that means that people are forced to relocate and to move off their ancestral lands. But I also want to reflect that um, the people presenting to you come from the global north, um, and so what I wanted to ask Shireen to do um, before I go on with some reflections from the Pacific context is to share a link to Kathy Jetnell Kijner's poem, which was um, used as a kind of advocacy art activist moment, a moving story in the sense of an emotional and a kind of resonant story that launched the UN Climate Summit in 2014. And I think carries through some of the themes that I'm gonna talk about. So thank you. Please bear with me while I call the video up. Thank you. No problem. She's a Marshallese poet, so I think it's really nice to hear her voice rather than just to hear voices from the Global North, given the context and focus on story. Here, Mata Philippi. It comes with a video, Shireen. I'm not sure if it's possible. Yeah, I'm sorry. I um, have too many screens open. Just a second, I'll be with you. No please. problem. Dear Mata Filipino, you are a seven month old sunrise of gummy smiles. You are bald as an egg and bald as the Buddha. Your thighs that are thunder, shrieks that are lightning, so excited for bananas, hugs, and our morning walks along the lagoon. Dear Mata Filipino, I want to tell you about that lagoon, that lucid, sleepy lagoon lounging against the sunrise. Men say that one day, that lagoon will devour you. 
They say it will gnaw at the shoreline, chew at the roots of your breadfruit trees, gulp down rows of your sea walls, and crunch through your island's shattered bones. They say you, your daughter, and your granddaughter too, will wander rootless, with only a passport to call home. Dear Mata Filipina, don't cry. Mommy promises you, no one will come and devour you. No greedy whale of a company sharking through political seas. No backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals. No blindfolded bureaucracies gonna push this mother ocean over the edge. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's gonna become a climate change refugee. Or should I say, no one else. To the Carteret Islanders of Papua New Guinea and to the Taro Islanders of Fiji, I take this moment to apologize to you. We are drawing the line here. Because baby, we are going to fight. Your mommy, daddy, boo boo, dimma, your country, and your president too, we will all fight. And even though there are those hidden behind platinum titles who like to pretend that we don't exist, that the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Kiribati, Maldives, and Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines and floods of Pakistan, Algeria, and Colombia, and hurricanes, tidal waves, and earthquakes didn't exist, still, there are those who see us. Hands reaching out, fists raising up, banners unfurling, megaphones booming, and we are canoes blocking coal ships. We are the radiance of solar villages. We are the rich, clean soil of the farmer's past. We are petitions blooming from teenage fingertips. We are families biking, recycling, reusing, engineers dreaming, designing, building, artists painting, dancing, writing. We are spreading the word. And there are thousands out on the street marching with signs, hand in hand, chanting for change now. They're marching for you, baby. They're marching for us. Because we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. Dear Mata Filipino, you are eyes heavy with drowsy weight. So just close those eyes, baby, and sleep in peace. Because we won't let you down. You'll see. Thank you, Shireen. Um, so I think uh, the reason that I wanted to share that story is partly because it raises a lot of the different um, kind of uh, themes that come through the literature, but through art activism that expresses some of the emotional weight and the emotional tone of climate change. Um, and this is one of the things that I think is really interesting that comes through the educational research is that when we think about climate change and when we think about the ways to communicate and to discuss climate change, there's often a lot of emotional resonance. And there's been some really interesting research in, in the educational context, which raises the importance of stories that um, are messages that carry hope rather than despair or denial or ignoring in the ways that um, Kathy jetner -Kilchin is, um discusses of people who hide behind thinking that climate change isn't happening now, hasn't happened already and is just something to consider for the future or something to consider from afar. Um, but I think that her poem also raises questions of connections, of thinking about the global problem and its local um, translations as well as a notion of immobilities. And I think, um, Shireen, if you could move on to the next slide. So there's a lot of research um, within the Pacific states which recognize that um, for lots of communities who have kind of socio-cultural understandings that very much relate to identities that are tied with place and tied with the land and tied with the environment in which they uh, live and work um, and study and all of these different dimensions of life, that there is resistance to relocation and that there's resistance to movement. So that's something that we wanted to bring in in terms of the complexity of the climate change context around the ways that indigenous um, knowledges are often tied to land and um, particularly within the Pacific context. 
but we need to um, recognize the diversity of these indigenous knowledges without conflating them. So recognize the diversity of political accounts and world making, what Santos calls an ecology of knowledges, of bringing different stories together and of recognizing synergies, but also recognizing specificities. Um, it's also important to recognize agency within these stories and so to resist a kind of narrative of despair which constructs particular communities or individuals as passive victims solely of the impact of climate change without recognizing the complex processes that many of these individuals and communities go through in terms of adapting and becoming more resilient. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to do within the Transforming Universities for a Changing Climate project is to build a kind of understanding of participatory research. And so on our website, which is climateuni.com, which I'll put in the chat, um, we've developed some tools and some principles for participatory research for education um, and others working with communities um, to do research that recognizes these complexities and recognizes these indigenous forms of knowledge and situates these understandings of mobilities and immobilities within broader concepts of place and connection. Um, and there's within the educational context, then there's an interrelationship with already existing work to expand distance learning and to creatively think about ways to engage communities on the move, but also to think about the ways that we may need to adapt our curricula. And our colleague from Fiji, Rosiana Lagi, was sharing just this morning that in the Fijian context, they're thinking about teacher education in terms of teaching people how to live differently and how to move differently. So it translates in lots of different ways into the education system. But I think the key message for us is that neither migration nor climate change are any one thing. Great. Thank you so much. It's really um, a, a good note to end on, I think, in a way, uh, Charlotte, um, to help us remind us to unpick uh, what we mean by climate change, what we mean by its, un its uh, interaction with and, and the ways in which it drives um, migration. Uh, I think it was Elaine who said, you know, climate change doesn't itself cause migration, but it's preys on inequalities and it's those inequalities that we need to really understand more uh, in more depth and more broadly to, to understand and to, in some ways, be able to anticipate what the likely impacts of further um, interactions between climate factors and, and migration factors might look like. Um, we're going to open it up for discussion. And I thought just um, while people are uh, thinking about their questions, you can, so you can do that in two different ways. You can either put your question in the chat or you can raise your hand and um, we've got one hand raised here and I'm going to, uh, Shireen's got, Shireen, have you got a question now or? I do indeed. I have a couple of, um, points, but I'm okay. going to go on. ahead and then I'll, I'll, I have a couple too, but I'll, um, why don't you go ahead and then I'll ask mine and then others can think about other questions they may have. Right. Great. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for those wonderful presentations. They were actually very easy to listen to for someone like me, who's a non-specialist in this topic. So I'll be talking from my own personal experience of having grown up in Sierra Leone and particularly my early years where I grew up in a little place called Yengema in Kono, um, in the north of the country where we um, did clear land by um, burning um, and um, I kind of wanted to have your, you, you obviously talked about this in, um, in your presentations, but it's um, where I'm coming from is the fact that in West Africa, we have big organizations like Unilever and so on who go, who um, run um, palm oil plantations. Um, and we know there's been a lot of discussion around palm oil sustainability. And I just wanted to know your thoughts on um, the different ways, trying to think of the best way to put this. So these big organizations come in and they take loads of land and they do, they get rid of loads of wildlife and they drive out loads of people and then they, you, you know, produce palm oil for use in soap and industries. Whereas for Sierra Leoneans, palm oil is something that we eat, you know, very regularly. You know, we love our palm oil, we love it. 
we don't cause anything like the amount of environmental damage, yet we suffer more the consequences of the um, big organizations who use our land for their profit. So for me, I mean, it's all, of course, as you said, tied up with colonialism and inequalities, but I'm not a specialist. Um, I'm coming from a kind of emotional response. And I just wonder if you have any advice for people who live in countries like Sierra Leone about what do we do to expose what's happening and you know what what do we do how do we deal with that mm -hmm. uh, in saying that I realize as well that our own local governments have a role to play you know I the last time I went home I was appalled to see around the peninsula that so many forests had been cleared from hills it was even obvious it was obvious to even someone like me who knows nothing about agriculture and ecology that that was going to end badly and then the next year there was this terrible landslide so we have our own governments as well have a role to play they're not exempt but there is such a discrepancy you know the fact that we we suffer we cause the least damage but suffer the biggest consequences of these activities mm. do you understand okay. what I'm coming yeah, from? yeah yeah I think so I think we I think we got that question so let's go, let's take a few questions and then we'll come back and ask people to um respond to them so that's um great from Shane I was just going to um pose a couple of questions myself if that's all right and then I see Gloria's got a question as well um the one was I've been thinking about this throughout the course of all of your your talks and it starts right when from Fiona's discussion about how um the narratives and some of the the questions and the framing of of um our both journalistic and academic uh, literature has changed over time and I wonder whether we as as writers, academics, etc., um, sometimes take advantage of the tropes, uh, even if they're not rooted in evidence surrounding climate change and migration, knowing that they're likely to make people sit up and take notice. Um, do we are we guilty of somehow seizing hold of that um, and not doing enough to co correct some of the misperceptions? And that's a, a question that really anyone could speak to. And the second question was really um I was really so one one second the second question was around um it seems that all of us well i don't know uh, situating myself in terms of migration studies a lot of us are talking about the impact or the relationships between climate uh dynamics and migration but i don't see the same kind of discussion within climate scientists and the kind of when we talk i'm um, looking at some of the um, preparation for the COP26 meetings that are coming up later this year, migration is notably absent from most of the preparatory discussions. Uh, and of course, under unpacking um, migration and, and looking at how migration is a major adaptation to environmental change brings in a whole host of kind of practical implications, implications for cities, implications for education systems, as has been discussed here today. So, but maybe that's just my own perspective. So I wondered whether others wanted to speak to that. Um, so those are kind of a bit two questions there. Um, should we take those three questions and then we'll come back and go to, Fran to Gloria and Francesca and do another round. I don't want to overload people with too many questions at once. If that's all right. Does anyone, can somebody respond to Shireen's question about what, what can people do? Anyone? I can't. Well, let me see if I can see everyone. I can only right now see Fiona. <laughs> um, so that might mean I'm going to ask you to, <laughs> to the question. Yeah. So I I can I can oh, answer from the perspective of of being a journalist, and that would be yeah uh, yeah to, to make it news. Yeah. Um, uh, not being an activist or an organizer myself. Um, but yeah, m my personal belief is make it public, make it known, talk about it. Um, does anybody else want to have a go at that one? For me, it's also about 
um, building alliances with other communities that may face similar problems and, and recognising that balance between the synergies of particular contexts around colonialism or extractive approaches to, to natural resources. Um, even the framing, you know, Laura's talking about language, even this idea of resources, of natural resources, of things that should be used up. Um, can be challenged. So I think of trying to trying to connect and to build a kind of movement around it um, at the same time as recognizing the specificity of the Sierra Leonean case is a really good way forward as well. Mm, that's a good point. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, anyone want to speak to this questions of, um, of whether or not we're we're all kind of contributing to the hype without doing enough to do um, to clarify some of the confusions around migration and climate change. Does anyone agree that that's happening? I don't know. I, yeah, I was, I was going to ask a similar question to, to those of you in academia, um, yeah. which is how do you feel about this term threat multiplier, which um, I think came up a couple of years ago and sort of became like the catchphrase of the day that, um, so yeah, the theory being that climate migration, climate refugees, if that's the language that you choose to use, um, that that migration of movement isn't directly and solely a result of changing climate, but climate is a threat multiplier. So it takes political, economic, social instabilities, and it turns them into catastrophes that mean that people have to move in their millions, essentially. I may have mm -hmm. swayed it somewhat in my presentation of the theory, but yeah, I'm curious as to what people's opinions are of that terminology, threat multiplier. Hmm. Anyone else want to respond to either of those two? They're kind of two related questions. I think the I think the tropes idea is is a really um, you know, and do we buy into it or do we fail to challenge? them enough is, is a really important question. Part of it is like, it, you know, we're busy people, we kind of race through life and then you stop and think or you you learn more. I think we will, we all need to, um, you know, commit to sort of making sure that we we fact check things and uh, and whatever. And that's difficult to do when, when you're in a, a kind of a constantly busy um, circle and focusing on a particular area of work. I've certainly I mean, I, when Shireen first asked us to speak on climate change, I, I was quite anxious about this. I didn't really feel it was an area at all that I had anything to say on, but it's important to, but I learned a lot through the process. I think it's really important to engage with these ideas. In terms of the, the question of threat multiplier and, um, um, you know, um, um, and how climate, climate change might interact with these other uh, uh, global inequalities, et cetera. I guess it depends how it's being used and what for what purpose that term is being used. If it's if it's useful in in creating awareness and policy awareness around the issues and the complexities of the issues, fine. If it's hijacked for other purposes, yeah. I, so I guess for me it's always how language is used and how it's applied. I don't know if Amy or Charlie have Anything no, I would I would completely agree with that. And I also agree that I think we do often find ourselves not deliberately falling into reproducing kind of tropes and sometimes not spending the time to reflect on the kind of complexities and nuances. But I think that's also a feature of the kind of way in which as academics where also there are the, the pressures to to produce new, newsworthy research or to compete for funding and actually sometimes that isn't conducive to spending the time that is really important to reflect on, on, the, on the more subtle, nuanced kind of um, messages that are really important to, to give time and space to in mm. such a complex, in such complex issues of climate change and migration and then the, the interactions between them. Yeah, for me, there's, there's a really important distinction, I think, um, around whether a threat multiplier is, is, is recognizing vulnerability and recognizing structural and colonial inequalities, or is um, uh, denying agency and presenting people as kind of passive victims of a particular um, disaster. And I think the, the phrase that comes from the, no, from the natural disasters um, 
uh, field, which is that no disasters are natural, that all disasters are socially constructed by social and economic um, disadvantage and advantage, is really useful for the climate change field and can teach us a lot because climate change isn't, is, is socially and economically constructed as well. Yeah. So I think when we're talking about threat multiplier, in the way that Shireen is asking in the chat, we have to be really careful that we're not buying into the kind of Nigel Farage, Turkish migrant immigrants coming over the wall. Um, you know, I talked about stories. One of the other stories that was really interesting was John Lanchester's The Wall, which is kind of imagining a future UK where we're kind of concrete in and there's kind of boats patrolling for the other, which is a kind of undefined external community. Um, and I think it's really important not to kind of fall into the ways that that kind of um, language is co-opted by, by right wing and, and um, kind of diverse um, actors and politicized. Great, thank you very much. Um, Gloria Chan, you had a question. Um, I wondered if you wouldn't mind presenting it because I'm not sure that I entirely um, Oh, um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, hi. Um, um, hi, everyone. Um, I have a question because um, to me, um, th thanks for today's wonderful presentations. Um, to me, it's a very complex um, issues of um, climate change and migrations. I'm thinking because uh, as an individual, um, how can we, what would be the key actions for us that may contribute to, to this? Um, I understand that maybe raising awareness um, sort of things so, uh, that, that may help and just want to gain some insight from the speakers to see uh, what, what would be the key and some simple step that for us, like the individual in the UK that can contribute to this. Thank you. Okay, so that's a good question. What can we do to raise awareness about the, the issues surrounding um, climate related migration, I guess, yeah? Um, and Francesca? Mm, uh, I'm gonna, not going to be able to pronounce your last name, but I hope you're there. That's, a, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. uh, just a, yeah, I guess just a quick question surrounding um, COVID-19 and how COVID in itself is asking us, you know, to keep everyone safe and to stop spreading the disease. Is asking anyone to stay put? And how do we face a situation in which the environment might not let us stay put and might not let groups of people stay put? And at which point, is there anything in place to support them? Is there anything we can do to kind of, if there were, were fires again in Australia this year and groups of people had to move, is there anything we can do to help? Okay, great. That's a really good question. Yes, I, I often think of this when they, you see a lot of um, statistics coming out from the International Organization for Migration and other sources talking about the reductions in the numbers of people on the move. Uh, in their regular reporting. And I wonder how many of those people who are not moving are people who need to move um, uh, or would, would potentially need to move for whatever reason it is. Um, so it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, and um, so I'll bring in Shireen's question here. Do you, do you want to, well, you put it in the chat, but do you want to say something about it as well, Shireen? Um. Yeah, it's just, it's actually it's something that's a, a source of irritation to me, the, the, the language. I'm so glad I was actually just um, tweeting about Elaine's comment. I, you know, I studied Foucault an undergraduate, so I'm always interested in things around language. Um, and I'm so glad that you shone the spotlight on the judicious way that the, you know, language in these, in this context is used to frame and order. Um, debate away from the actual situation and, you know, the use of terms like, um, you know, tides and waves of migrant and the way that, you know, if you're white and rich, you're well white and got a little mm -hmm. bit of money and you decide to decamp to Spain, you're a migrant. Or even if you go, you're an, sorry, you're an expat, or even if you go to West Africa and put your feet up on your balcony and have people serving you tea at 6pm, you're an expat. Whereas if you're black and move to the country that forced you to move in the first place, you're a migrant. And there's kind of conceptions that go 
you know, the way with the you know the constructions that are made around use of such terms. So I just wondered if you wanted to say a little bit more about what we should be doing, because I think we know what the problem is, but how willing are people when they see these debates on Twitter or whatever to push back? You know, I just what I just wondered if you had any sort of inspirational words mm -hmm. to encourage people that it is actually important to push back when we hear and see this going on because that sort of language has real consequences. Again, sure. very noted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, both both forms of the the kind of privileging of some kinds of movement versus others, as well as the the use of these what Lisa Malky calls the botanical metaphors of flows and roots and um, swarms, uh, which can often be kind of overly uh, dramatic <laughs> and, and cause, um, you know, undue concern about certain elements of, um, you know, what, about, the, about the impacts of the relations between migration and, and displacement. Um, th and that relates as well, I'm just going to sneak in one, one kind of comment here from Patty Knudsen, who's, I'm going to just, um, uh, characterize your your comment if I can just in the interest of time but the point about um, how agency needs to be broken down in terms of who's representing or voicing the prospective migrants affected by climate change um, so that there may be uh, local government uh, as in Shireen's example from Sierra Leone um, might be in a twist uh, between more resources and social protection so uh, you know clearly the the inequalities that exist, um, globally, but also even locally in terms of people being affected. It's kind of more of a comment, I guess, than a question. Anybody want to respond to any of those uh, questions or comments in this round? And I think the we'll length... Have... One oh, more sorry. Yeah, did you want to go? <laughs> I think the language one is really important because it links back to that question around how we educate and, and, and educate ourselves and others and make people aware of some of these in, in you know that the use of language and how it how it defines people in particular ways um i think i think the language is so so important and the way the the media and the and policy language intersect in such complex ways you know feeding into each other and and creating this language and and and, and so it becomes kind of dominant ways in which we understand these things so i think anything in terms of educational programs or whatever that can push back against that there's a nice example of work that I've done with colleagues around poverty and the language of talking about people living in poverty, um, both in the UK and internationally. And that was building alliances with media organizations and media unions and actually developing a resource which actually really encouraged journalists to think about the language that they were using and to critically engage with it. I don't know whether Fiona, you have, whether there's space for that or whether you have any thoughts on that, but I thought that was a really, a, it, it's, it's a bit drip drip in terms of it's how it changes language, but it does work in, in particular areas of the media, I think, slowly over time. Yeah, was that on a, um sort of on an organizational basis or on yeah, an international um, union of journalists yeah so did they engage with like particular you know for example the telegraph or something like directly with the newsroom or was it that um individual journalists would engage so the organization we were working with we were engaging with the union and then they put together a set of media guidance uh lines for reporting on poverty so how how widely it was then used, of course, will depend on um, yeah, yeah, multiple things in terms of who it reaches, etc. Yeah, I think those guidelines can be quite helpful. Um, if I think back to my my first years reporting, um, particularly um, groups that worked on suicide had quite a lot of success with kind of, for lack of a better word, regulating the language that was used around it, uh, and also um, we. Uh, language change from disabled people to people with a disability um, and I, I know that that is quite mainstream and um, pro people probably wouldn't even remember remember being educated on that it's just become reflexive so um, yeah I think it's definitely possible um, yeah I suppose it just depends on the way that you're engaging mm. um, I can speak to um, Francesca's question about yeah. um so um perhaps colleagues from academia can assist with the language but i think there's the difference between slow onset and 
is it long? No, Solonshire and Rapid Onset, thank you. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you probably uh, are currently in the situation where there are people who perhaps have been thinking about maybe leaving a, an agricultural area uh, for lack of access to water or something like that, but it's not an immediate um, urgency versus, I mean, we have seen that there have been over the past year um, emergencies where people have been you know forced together in the streets and you can feel you can feel that looking at that the anxiety of the emergency on top of the anxiety of all being forced together when there's a pandemic happening mm. um would be quite extreme um so i think uh yeah i suppose the emergencies are kind of handled in the way that emergencies generally always are and then this slow onset um is kind of a different issue Okay. Anybody else want to take any of these questions? No. I'm going to move. I'm going to do one more uh, round. I think uh, Wafa had her hand up. Hi. I'm going to um, put the yeah. camera on so you can see. Perfect. Me. Nice to see um, you. <laughs> hi. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really, really um, useful. Um, my, I myself am a, a researcher in humanitarian energy. So my research is very, um, very pragmatically oriented and very kind of much aimed at practitioners and people who are kind of working in migration and then also, I guess, kind of responding to different forms of migration caused by multi-dimensional things. Um, and in, I guess my question is about the way we've been talking a lot about language and the kind of like limitations of these kind of categorizations or labels um, and I guess my question is what's what's the way for me to satisfy the practical requirements of my research being kind of within the framings that people understand and that people use while still kind of being critical and and making sure not to kind of like accept it as as it is um, that kind of I guess a, a tension that I'm still trying to resolve at the moment Mm. Um, yeah, I would love to hear. Okay, that's a really good question. Yeah, there are lots of, some of this language is, is, a, is a marker, right? So you want to situate yourself within that discussion at the same time you want to um, rail against it in a way and not to reproduce the, the same dynamics. Um, Elaine, I see you nodding. Do you want to say something about oh. that question? <laughs> yeah, I think it's such a good question. And, and I think something that we come across the whole time, where we're often constrained by the language when we're writing about the, the, these issues. Um, and I think it's probably, I, I would say, have a conversation with it in, in your writing. And, and, and as, you're, as you're presenting uh, what you write, you know, highlight as in, and, and, and it, as you present ideas about, I'm, I'm working with this language, but I'm constrained by it. It doesn't capture this, or or it it, um, I, it um, kind of presents people in a particular way, which doesn't capture whatever it is you want to try and put across. So, I think engaging with the with the uh, limitations of the language we've got and the the language that that that's used and applied um, in a kind of discursive way is is a, is a good way to go. That would be my suggestion. Great, thanks. Um, Amy, did you want to say something? No, I was going to say I completely agree, but I think it's a really great question and it's um, it's a tension I'm dealing with at the moment. I'm writing a chapter for our, for our book and I keep rereading what I've written and thinking I'm not happy with the words that I'm using, but I don't necessarily have better ones. So it's then how you how you present that and draw that out yeah. and, and recognize the tension, I think. Mm -hmm. mm. That's really, really good. So we have one time for one more question, which uh, Oliver Hurst, you'd put something in the in the um, chat. Would you like to present your question? Yeah, um, so just a bit of background. I'm a student at Queen Mary um, University of London, and I recently wrote an essay about um, migration governance and it, a lot of the things we've already discussed around language and the sort of politics of migration is really useful because it was basically what I was discussing throughout that essay. Um, and one of the things that came up in it was how, again, looking back to that language, that a lot of the ways the media or um, policy, policy circles, et cetera, describe um, migrants themselves, you know, they tend to 
not all of them, I mean, but some um, tend to sort of other them. And there's a, some, there's a lot of uh, neo-colonial dimensions to that. And I was wondering with Elaine, um, do you know, because a lot of your work is focused in sort of education and climate change and migration, um, do you, what would be your opinion on how we can use education as a way to sort of decolonize these quite uh, in unjust and ethically challenging questions of uh, migration governance? Yeah, I think that's such a big question and it, and it speaks to the whole um, decolonizing uh, agenda for curricula uh, 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 sort of across education as a whole. I think it's about engaging critically with how things are represented and, and, um, and giving counter representations of that using you know um looking at where we're drawing our sources from where who's writing about these things where are they writing from what experiences are they writing from so bringing in counter voices wherever we can i think that's mm -hmm. absolutely fundamental to this whole agenda across all aspects of our uh, of education and learning but particularly in the in the context of uh, migration and issues around climate change i don't know if others have um anything to add but that would be my my short response mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's also about situating yourself within the knowledge production and the knowledge reproduction Absolutely. and being explicit about your own positionality and where you come from and not trying to present a kind of my colleague at, at UCL talks about the kind of God's eye view in relation mm -hmm. to knowledge reproduction and so moving away and so talking very specifically from your own position and, and being um, explicit about that is, is really useful and important. Great, thank you so much. I think we're just about out of time. So um, we have only time for me to say thank you to our, our four speakers, Fiona, Amy, Elaine and Charlotte. And, um, and thank you for really opening up, I think, an, a conversation that probably has to continue on in a multitude of different kinds of corridors and, and with different audiences. So I hope that we'll all uh, take them away to our respective audiences and carry them on uh, and continue these discussions and, and, and thinking uh, about these, some of these issues. Um, thank you as well to Shireen for hosting us. And uh, I hope that we'll gather again in another uh, event on to talk some more about these, some of these issues. Thank you everyone for joining. Before we go, I'm just gonna be opportunistic and enjoy, jump in here to remind people to please connect with us. I also want to say a huge thank you to our wonderful panel of women. They do say, if you want something done, ask a busy woman. So I just contacted the busiest women I know and look what happened. Wonderful, <laughs> thank you so much, sisters. Um, this has been one of a number of events that LIDC runs. We're also um, publicizing now an event of particular importance to women because it's about period poverty, 27th May. So check out our website and register for that. We need your ideas. We need your inspiration. We do podcasts, interview featured members stuff. So if you have research that you want us to publicize or you have an idea for an event and don't know how to go about it, let us know. If you're in a member organization, sign up for membership. And even if you're not in a member organization, you can sign up for membership. So yes, yeah, stay in touch, keep us inspired. The struggle is real, unfortunately, and has to continue. So thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to our wonderful chair, Laura, you stepped in at very short notice thank and was so helpful and so kind. And on a personal note, I'm very, very grateful. So thank you, LIDC, um, for, give, for creating a job for me to have. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> Did I really say that out loud? Um, my manager's listening. And thank you everyone for registering and joining us today. We will see you at future events. And thank you for your time again. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Everybody. Thank you.